Hi, Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. We've already made it to video H, and here we're going to focus on the anterior pituitary, also referred to as the adenohypophysis. Words that have the prefix adeno or adenoid in it typically refer to glandular. And remember, true glands are made up of epithelial tissue. So the adenohypophysis, or the anterior pituitary, is made up of um, epithelial cells. And many of these cells have different functions because you'll see that the anterior pituitary produces quite a few hormones. You see some of them listed here. And so all of these different cells, these epithelial cells, are different epithelial cells producing these different hormones. This epithelial tissue that makes up the anterior pituitary is actually developed from our oral mucosa, so from our mouth. Remember the posterior pituitary developed from the brain. Now we do not see axons reaching all the way from the hypothalamus into the anterior pituitary. We see a different anatomy. So this time we have a vasculature, particularly at the level of the infundibulum, where we see what we refer to as the primary capillary plexus of the hypophyseal portal system. And then in the anterior pituitary, we see the so-called secondary capillary plexus of the hypophyseal portal system. So once again, we're seeing the term portal here. We've come across this before. For instance, we learned about the hepatic portal system where we saw the um, hepatic portal vein carrying the blood into the liver and from the liver then or the liver was then drained by a by hepatic vein so we went from vein back to vein through a bunch of capillaries and then back to a vein in the case of the kidneys we had arterial going to a capillary bed called the glomerulus leaving the capillary bed via an arterial again so that's another example of a portal system here we see how we interconnect two capillary beds, one called the um, primary capillary plexus and then one, the other one called the secondary plexus, uh, interconnected by what we refer to as the hypophyseal portal veins. So how does this, this anatomy of these capillary beds relate to the mechanism by which the hypothalamus controls the anterior pituitary. Well, in the hypothalamus, we have a bunch of so-called neurosecretory cells, basically cells, neurons, that are going to produce hormones. And these are going to be our so-called releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones. And notice that they're all amino acid based. None of these are going to be steroid based. So let's assume that the hypothalamus is secreting releasing hormones. They are now going to be um, stored at the level of the axonal terminals of these axons right here that leave the hypothalamus and um, head towards the infundibulum where we have our primary capillary plexus. So with action potentials propagating down these axons, these releasing hormones will then be dumped into this primary capillary plexus. These releasing hormones will then travel via these portal veins to the secondary um, capillary plexus that is now literally forming a spider web around and throughout the various epithelial cells that form the anterior pituitary. And depending on which releasing hormones were released by the hypothalamus, we're going to see that specific cells will have specific receptors for these releasing hormones, such that perhaps now 
TSH is released, or ACTH, or FSH, or LH, etc., etc., etc. We'll learn what these abbreviations all stand for. So the big difference here is that we're depending on that hypophysial portal system for the hypothalamus to communicate with the epithelial cells of the anterior pituitary. Here then is a, a nice table giving you an overview of the hormones produced by the hypothalamus as well as the anterior pituitary gland. What the targets are of each one of the hormones and what the impacts are of each one of the hormones. So this is a nice summary to come back to after you've been more exposed to the details of all these various hormones. Remember the hypothalamus is going to release either releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones. A well-studied hormone that's produced by the anterior pituitary that you've heard plenty about I'm sure is called growth hormone abbreviated with GH and um, sometimes called somatotropin and if you translate that soma referring to body remember tropin being a hormone that triggers the release of other hormones so it's a, a, a body hormone that triggers the release of other hormones it's a hormone that has an, has an impact impact on many many different parts of the body the hypothalamus release, uh, regulates the release of growth hormone by growth hormone releasing hormone or by growth hormone inhibitory hormone, which is often referred to as somatostatin. Um, listen to what it says, soma referring to the body again, statin as in um, making it static or, or inhibiting uh, or having inhibiting functions, I should say. IGF stands for insulin-like glucose factor. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. TH for thyroid hormone. So growth hormone is regulated by these releasing and inhibitory hormones of the hypothalamus and that then by a hormone that's produced by many cells called IGF-1 as well as thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroid hormone and by itself. Growth hormone is rather cyclic, just like melatonin. It tends to be high at night, and it tends to be highest during adolescence, and when, as we get older, it decreases in amount. Growth hormone has some interesting effects on the body. We can separate them into direct effects and indirect effects. So let's get started with those direct effects. Within the direct effects, we have three kinds. We have the growth effects, the glucose sparing effects, and the diabetogenic effects. Diabetogenic, listen to what that word means, the create genesis, right? The creation of diabetes-like effects, essentially, meaning um, increased glucose levels. But let's get started with the growth effects, because that's why the hormones called growth hormones. So Growth hormone is going to stimulate lots of cell division. It's what allows for our skeleton to grow. It allows for our skeletal muscles to develop. So lots of anabolic processes, which um, depend on protein synthesis. And of course, for cells to be able to go through protein synthesis, they need amino acids. And consequently, they do a lot of uptaking from the blood, um, uptaking these amino acids. So that's the growth effect. Then we have something called the glucose sparing effect, meaning that growth hormone is going to leave the glucose that's already in the blood in the blood. It's not going to, it's going to prevent the cells from using that glucose. So that's why we call it the glucose sparing effect. And instead, it's going to stimulate um, lipolysis, literally meaning the splitting of lipids, such that cells can then use the fatty acids in the blood rather than using glucose. And so now we again decrease the rate of glucose uptake. And then there's the diabetogenic effect where the growth hormone will now actually help with increasing the glucose levels in the blood. 
by a process that we've talked about before called glycogenolysis. Um, the liver is good at going through the process of glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis referring to the splitting, glycis, splitting of glycogen. And remember, glycogen is just a bunch of, is a molecule, a polysaccharide made up of many glucose molecules. So I'll just describe it as follows, right? As a matter of fact, when, let's say you've eaten a, a donut, a five donuts this morning so that you have a high amount of glucose in your blood, um, your cells, let's ignore growth hormone for a moment, but your cells will try to use that glucose for aerobic respiration to make ATP, but you've eaten so many donuts so that there's so much glucose in the blood. So what has happened with that extra glucose? Your liver can store that in the form of glycogen. Now, let's come back to growth hormone. When growth hormone has its diabetogenic effects, it will then tap into, or the growth hormone will trigger the liver to now break up that glycogen such that individual glucose molecules can enter into the bloodstream. So we have the growth effect, from there the term growth hormone, the glucose sparing effect, which is, which is um, the effect in which growth hormone will make sure that cells are not using the glucose that's already in the blood. Instead, we're going to see that the lipids are going to be used to, um, to, to help the cells metabolize and we leave the glucose alone. And growth hormone can actually help increase glucose levels in the blood by breaking down the polysaccharide called glycogen, particularly in the liver. So those are direct effects. Now we also have indirect effects, which involve the liver. The liver will release, for instance, insulin-like growth factor, and that then will um, have impact on the growth hormone's growth effect. So let's take a look at a figure to better understand all this. So when the hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone because these axons are propagating an action potential such that the releasing hormone is dumped into our portal system here. So growth hormone releasing hormone makes it to the epithelial cells of the anterior pituitary and some of these epithelial cells will bind growth hormone releasing hormone, which then triggers them to release growth hormone. Growth hormone can then trigger the uptake of amino acids by cells such that they can go through uh, protein synthesis to therefore increase the size of the skeleton, skeletal muscles, even our nervous system is impacted and our immune cells. It's also going to spare glucose in the blood by instead uh, breaking down fats so, such that um, fats are being used to fuel our cells. And it's going to also allow for glucose levels to increase in the blood, better referred to as the diabetogenic effect. And a good way of, of um, illustrating that is by thinking of the liver who can break down with the help of growth hormone the glycogen into individual glucose molecules that are then um, dumped into the blood. The in, these are your three direct effects of growth hormone. And then the indirect effect is that um, the liver is going to release a hormone called insulin-like growth factor. And that insulin-like growth factor will then trigger the growth effects of um, the growth hormone. Now the hypothalamus also can produce growth hormone inhibitory hormone, and as the name says, it's going to inhibit the release of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary, and therefore all these direct as well as indirect effects are going to not happen. In addition to growth hormone, the anterior pituitary produces thyroid-stimulating hormone, which is regulated 
by the hypothalamus with the help of thyroid releasing hormone. So the thyroid releasing hormone triggers the release of thyroid stimulating hormone, which in turn triggers the release of thyroid hormone. So therefore, both um, thyroid releasing hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone are considered tropic hormones. Thyroid stimulating hormone is often also referred to as thyrotropin. And it's needed, it needs to prod the thyroid to ensure that the thyroid will develop properly. There isn't such a thing as thyroid um, hormone uh, inhibiting hormone, and instead we have um, a mechanism by which, uh, or a negative feedback mechanism such that when there's an increase in thyroid hormone levels, we're going to see that thyroid releasing hormone is not going to be released anymore. And if, um, and also growth hormone inhibitory hormone can actually impact um, the release of thyroid releasing hormone. The anterior pituitary gland also controls the adrenal cortex. So the adrenal glands are made up of an outer layer called the cortex, and then the inner layer, which you're pretty familiar with, called the medulla. The medulla produces norepinephrine and epinephrine, but the, the cortex secretes all kinds of steroids, including aldosterone, for instance. And so what controls the adrenal cortex is a hormone called ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone. So what does this hormone literally say? It's, well, for one, a tropic hormone. You know what that means by now. Cortico referring to the cortex, the adrenal cortex. Or I should say adrenocortico referring to adrenal cortex. It can also be referred to as the as corticotropin for short. It is controlled by the corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. And once again, via a negative feedback mechanism, if these hormones produced by the adrenal cortex begin to increase in level, then we'll see that they have an inhibitory effect on the further release of ACTH by the anterior pituitary. Like many hormones produced by the pituitary, these are, um, ACTH is also pretty uh, cyclic. This time its levels tend to be rather high uh, shortly after we get up. And its levels tend to rise when we have a fever, when we're hypoglycemic and under a lot of stress. And you'll see how stress and the adrenal cortex, um, along with the adrenal medulla, um, are interrelated. The anterior pituitary also produces tropic hormones that control our gonads, in the female the ovaries, and in the male the testes. And both these hormones are collectively referred to as the gonadotropic hormones. Both in males and in females, we have a gonadotropic hormone called follicle-stimulating hormone. Doesn't sound like a, a male hormone, but it is also part of the male. And luteinizing hormone, which sometimes in the male is referred to as interstitial cell-stimulating hormone, or abbreviated ICSH. We'll look at these hormones in more detail in the reproductive system. The final hormone to mention for the anterior pituitary is called prolactin. And if you listen to the word prolactin before lactation, um, in other words, it's a hormone that has something to do with lactation. As a matter of fact, it stimulates milk production in the pregnant female. So it's not the hormone that allows for the milk to be ejected, but it allows for the milk to be produced. Remember, oxytocin is the hormone that allows for the milk to be ejected. Prolactin levels are going to rise and fall depending on what the estrogen levels are in the female, and it is primarily responsible for causing such tender breasts um, during specific times of our, of our cycle. Prolactin can also increase testosterone production in, in males, and it's regulated by prolactin-releasing hormones secreted by the hypothalamus, 
and prolactin inhibitory hormone, which is really one and the same thing as dopamine, by the way. So this is our last hormone of the anterior pituitary. We're moving on to the thyroid and the parathyroid glands in the next video.